Tommy Reichenthal was born in 1935 in Pristana, Slovakia. In 1944, he was captured and deported to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp with his mother, grandmother, brother, aunt and cousin. When he was liberated on the 15th of April 1945, he discovered that 35 members of his extended family were murdered in the Holocaust. He moved to Ireland in 1959. For 60 years, Tommy could not speak of his experience. Since breaking his silence in 2004, Tommy began to speak about this, traveling around the country to give talks in schools, colleges and universities. And in those talks, he has discussed in detail this period um, and his life. As seen in his book, I Was a Boy in Belson, and, and the documentary till the 10th generation. He is also regularly invited to present his lectures for private events. He has spoken at Harvard um, University and Cambridge Union, two places I've been to, um, but I have not spoken at them. So although we have something in common, I haven't had the privilege as um, Tommy has to, to be at those um, phenomenal um, institutions for discussion and debate. Um, and closer to home, he has uh, spoken at Leinster House, to the European Parliament, and uh, to the Naval Academy, um, military bases, and many other public and private associations. As the number of Holocaust survivors diminish, Tommy is acutely aware that he is now one of the final survivors of the Holocaust and is compelled to tell his story. And tonight, I'm delighted to say, he will tell his story to us, having had the privilege of meeting him last week myself directly. Um, Tommy, hello. Hello. Yes, sir. How are you this evening? Yeah, I'm all right and uh, thank you very much for the lovely introduction and of course it was pleasurable also having you in our home and uh, having tea with us and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, present uh, my experiences uh, in your association. It, it is a very important uh, uh, thing for me. Uh, as you mentioned, I did not speak about the Holocaust for over 50 years. And uh, eventually I uh, decided uh, uh, about 2004, so it's about 20 years now, uh, that I lecturing uh, about the Holocaust uh, because I think uh, that is important, especially that I lost over 35 members of my family in the Holocaust, that their memory is not forgotten. So uh, the opportunity uh, to speak in uh, not only colleges, university, but also private association, and of course, not only in Ireland, uh, I am now, uh, of course, uh, uh, at the age, it's not so easy for me to travel. But uh, prior to the COVID, uh, uh, I used to travel all over the world, in Eastern Europe, in uh, America, in, in uh, South Africa, and uh, many other uh, countries. Uh, uh, including Germany, uh, talking to German students about uh, the Holocaust. Uh, it is uh, special uh, because uh, we might as well ask today uh, what we are talking about Holocaust is it's history. It's a it's long time ago. But as you can see, I'm a part of this history. There are still people uh, alive that experience uh, this uh, horrific uh, time. And especially in Ireland, because Ireland is a neutral country, also during the Second World War, uh, not much 
uh, was learned about the Holocaust in Ireland, it was really uh, in the uh, curriculum uh, part of the second world war. <clears throat> Uh, when the students were learning, uh, the Holocaust was mentioned, and therefore the student knew very little about the Holocaust. And that was one of the reasons that promptly prompted me uh, to decide to speak about the Holocaust. And uh, even though I didn't speak about it for 50 years, now nobody can stop me i'm 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 uh, still uh, speaking but now i'm doing it through the zoom which works very well uh, because as before i used to visit every school from that point of view it was uh, uh, more uh, it it had a bigger impact because of course uh, people uh, feel that they want to shake my hand. They actually want to, to see the presence of one of the people that belong to a recent uh, tragic history. But still, the Zoom is also very successful uh, because at the moment I don't need to go to every school. Quite the opposite, I have several schools coming to me. So usually it's on Friday and all the appointments we put on the same day. And so I can speak to five, six, seven schools at the same time. There might be between 400 to over 1,000 students listening to me uh, at, every time I speak. So I'm reaching uh, the much bigger uh, audience because of uh, this uh, uh, Zoom that that is the only good thing that we got out of the uh, tragic, uh, 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 tragic uh, disease that for two years we uh, suffered. So uh, I, as uh, Michael introduced me, I was born in Slovakia, in central Slovakia, about 90 kilometers from Bratislava. Uh, we lived in a small village called Merashice. My father was a farmer and my grandfather had a village shop. We were very much integrated into the village life. And uh, of course, everybody knew us. We knew everybody. And the relationship was very good with the uh, local people. We had never trouble. And in the quite opposite, if the local people needed any help, uh, for example, if they wanted to get a good doctor or lawyer or anything like uh, uh, that, they would go to my grandfather or to my father and uh, they would invite, uh, advise them uh, to who to go. And uh, even, even uh, if anybody needed the help in some way, uh, my grandfather would be uh, obliged. So we were actually very much liked in the village. But all this began to change in, uh, in 1939, when, uh, when the war uh, started on the Polish border and uh, uh, Germany began to invade the Poland and other Eastern uh, uh, state. And of course, uh, uh, not long afterwards, uh, the, the atrocity uh, were uh, being uh, uh, heard about 
and uh, the Jewish people uh, become very isolated and uh, very frightened. Uh, but in Slovakia, really, uh, the the discrimination and uh, open uh, open uh, hatred against the Jews began in 1941 in September when the first uh, anti-Jewish laws were introduced and it was called the Jewish Codex. Now, at this Jewish Codex, there were 270 paragraphs discriminating against the Jews. I just want to mention a couple of them and especially the ones that uh, uh, touched uh, on, on, uh, on me personally, even though I was only six years old at the time. We had to wear a yellow star on the left side uh, that identified us as Jews, of course, and uh, we were not allowed to go to any public places like cinema, theater, swimming pool, public park. Uh, the uh, Jewish people were uh, not allowed to be employed uh, in government places and also uh, in being in the uh, in the Slovak army. Uh, and also uh, the children uh, were the Jewish children were thrown out of the state school. Uh, we were we had to go uh, to a Jewish school, and that was really the first time I discovered even that there is this discrimination. There was not. Uh, much talked about it uh, in the home uh, because uh, the uh, parents and uh, even people come uh, to visit uh, uh, they would uh, speak in a very uh, very uh, uh, not loud uh, uh, voice so that we didn't hear what they were talking about or they would speak in a in Hungarian, which which we couldn't understand at the time, and uh, talking about the uh, uh, time that the Jewish people were going through, and uh, so as a six-year-old in 1941, uh, I was going to the national school in the village, but of course, once the Jewish codex came out. Um, I was thrown out of the from the school, and I had to go to the neighboring town uh, where there was a Jewish school uh, to start to go to the first class and the second class. And it was there that uh, I discovered all the hatreds which I couldn't understand. Because in the village, I did not wear the yellow star uh, because there was, first of all, everybody knew us. So I didn't need to wear the yellow star to identify myself. But of course, the main thing was that um, there was no police. The yellow star was uh, about the, this size. We wore it on the left side, about 10 centimeter diameter. And once I come to the town, I remember the evening before I was going to the new school, my aunt, because I went to my aunt in, in the town, which was called Nitra. There was a quite a large uh, Jewish population, about 5,000. So there were... Uh, several Jewish school there. And uh, when my aunt was sewing this yellow star on my coat, I asked, what is that for? And she said, it's nothing, we are Jewish. 
and we have to wear the yellow star. Now, you have to realize that at the time, we were very, very innocent as six-year-old, because when I compare it uh, to today, children at uh, six, uh, they know so much, and not only uh, what is happening around, but even generally around the world, through the television, radio, and the newspaper, of course. But during this time, when I was six years old, uh, we had very limited information. And I remember when somebody was going through the village and went to the pub and left the newspaper behind, uh, we used to read the news, what is, I'm, I'm not me, but uh, the adults, uh, used to read the newspaper and see what is uh, uh, happening all around the world. So, uh, as a child, I I didn't know what was happening beyond the village, never mind what is happening internationally. So, when when my aunt said, uh, yeah, we, we have to wear the yellow star because uh, we uh, are Jewish. I didn't even ask uh, what reason, but I have to wear a yellow star. I will wear it. But of course, it had uh, consequences because when I was going to the school, my aunt would uh, take me for the first one or two uh, day or three day. The school was only down the road, about 300 yards from where we were living, because the Jewish population lived uh, sort of in the, a certain part of the town. So the synagogue, the, uh, 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 the community hall, the school, everything was very near. So after two or three days, when uh, my aunt said, uh, you know where the school is, you're going down the road, and uh, there on the left is the school, so you can go on your own. And this was the time that uh, when children on the corner shop would uh, stand there in a group, they were Gentiles, and I would go with the yellow star, suddenly they started to shout at me, you dirty Jew, you smelly Jew, go to Palestine, and all kind of uh, insult. And as the time went on, they become more aggressive. They wanted to catch me and beat me up, which they did once or twice. And uh, they would try to spit at me, and they, they used to throw a stone after me. So it was a very frightening time. And I remember I used to run all the way to the school. And when I saw children on the right side, I would uh, run to the left side and vice versa. When I saw children, they were not much older than me, but they were in a group, six, seven of them. So it was very frightening. And when they caught me, they would... Uh, kicked me in the backside a couple of times and they let me go. I used to come home crying to my aunt. I don't want to go to the school. Uh, and of course, it was an option. She said, you have to go, just don't get involved with the children. It went for a good while like this, but uh, eventually, uh, and it was in the uh, after the, uh, uh, the the Banze conference in January in Germany, when uh, the decision was taken uh, to uh, to eradicate uh, the Jewish people, and the way they found it uh, was uh, by. Uh, all kind of means. First of all, uh, it was the mass shooting with the Einsatzgruppen, and then later because uh, it was morally 
affecting the German uh, soldier they found where, and of course we know about the gas chamber which they used to to uh, to murder uh, a million of Jewish people, and uh, it was then that uh, also in Slovakia uh, arrest began. Uh, of the first young people, young women from, and men from the age of 16 to 36. And uh, I remember at the time uh, that we accompanied my cousins, uh, uncle and aunt, uh, when they be being called up. And the idea was that uh, they said that, that the Jewish people have to work and and the living, uh, because of course uh, the the Slovak government uh, wish the the uh, um, uh, Jewish codex. They created the situation that uh, uh, Jewish people couldn't be employed, and even they confiscated uh, uh, property and and businesses. Uh, so. Uh, uh, they imposed restriction how much money the Jewish people can take from the bank even if they had enough money in the bank they restricted it from time to time to less and less so they really brought the uh, uh, Jewish population on their knees uh, the, the, the poverty began to set in and when uh, the Slovak government announced that they will take the people into camps and uh, set up business, uh, 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 set up factories, and it was uh, mainly tailoring factories where the Jewish people did the uniform for the Slovak army, uh, printing uh, places where the Jewish people they print all the propaganda uh, because at the time the propaganda of course was spread uh, to Slovakia as I said we didn't have uh, the information system we have today that more, most of the propaganda was spread to the churches because uh, at the masses the, the priests they would preach that all the troubles that Slovakia is suffering is the fault of the uh, Jews. Why is not unemployment? It's the fault of the Jews and they take the best job. There were uh, a big percentage uh, of the Jewish people were lawyers and, and doctors and that's created uh, this uh, uh, jealousy that the Jewish people had the best jobs and of course they did very well and uh, so the propaganda was that the Jews are taking all the money and all kind of uh, things that slowly uh, the Slovak people began to believe. Uh, it, when the deportation started as I mentioned 1940 Two, beginning of 1942, uh, the first people were taken were the young people. So among them were uh, our teachers. So one day, I think it was about uh, February 1942, uh, uh, we were told that the school is uh, closing and we can go home. And so, in February 1942, I was uh, seven years old, my education ended. The next time I went to school was in 1945, uh, beginning of 1946, after the war. And I never forget that time, because uh, when I come to the school, I couldn't write, I couldn't read, I couldn't do any mathematics. So I had to start from scratch. I went uh, to school. I, I was already 10 years old uh, in 1945. 
and I had to sit in uh, uh, classes with children six, seven year old uh, because I have to learn uh, how to read and write. And this time was very difficult for me at the time because, of course, the children would bully me. They did not realize what I went through and that I was in concentration camp. And out of ignorance and out of uh, uh, not asking, uh, and they thought that I'm just stupid, and this is why I'm uh, with them. So when these children, after the day of being school, went out and they uh, began to play with uh, uh, and having their childhood, uh, I sat home and was taking private lessons uh, so that I uh, can advance and uh, get with my own age. Uh, despite the setback and everything that I went through, thankfully, I did eventually go to a college and uh, finally I qualified as a diploma engineer. In the end, I was quite successful uh, in my, uh, I had my own business and uh, I, I didn't do badly in my adult life, but it was very difficult time for us at the time. So once these arrests began from the beginning, as I said, we accompanied my cousin, uh, they were being taken away and they were promised they will be working in these uh, uh, factories that uh, they set up in these uh, camps. And therefore, there was an atmosphere of uh, celebration that at least the uh, Slovak people, the Slovak government, the Slovak, uh, Slovak propaganda couldn't say that the Jews were parasites and they were living on the back of the uh, Slovak state, but uh, that, that the Jewish people worked for their living. And uh, as I mentioned, it was the government that created this, this situation and then they blamed the Jews that they are parasites and they have to keep them uh, and so on. The propaganda was, of course, uh, uh, very strong. And as I said, many people uh, believe that. I must say that in the village, we were still very popular. Uh, the people liked us. And um, when the police come to the village and looking for us, we would lock the house and hide in the cornfield or somewhere. And uh, we were never betrayed. So, uh, but it was more uh, uh, not that the people didn't have contact with us, but it was more that we didn't want to have contact with them because we didn't want to put the people into trouble. If a, a, a Gentile was very friendly with a Jew, uh, they would be accused that they're Jew lovers and all kinds of uh, things. And we didn't want it that uh, uh, these people get into trouble. So we sort of lived through several years uh, in the village. Uh, the arrest of Jews was uh, happening and the years passed, uh, 42, 43, 44. And it was in 1944 that uh, uh, there was an uprising in Slovakia uh, because Slovakia was a friendly country towards Germany. Uh, in Slovakia, we had a fascist government and they cooperated with Germany. Uh, as, as I said, the war started on the Polish border. And of course, Slovakia has a border with, with Poland. So the German 
used to transport the ammunition and the heavy equipment, the tanks and guns and the manpower through Slovakia uh, to Poland. And uh, Slovakia pro provided the, the trains and the uh, uh, transport facilities to transport all this equipment so the Germans were able to conduct that uh, war in Europe. So while the rest of Europe was being occupied by Germany, France, Belgium, uh, and of course the east, east of uh, Europe, the Poland and the eastern country, Yugoslavia, and so on. Slovakia actually was not occupied because Slovakia had a friendly relation with Germany. But in 1944, the Slovak people rebelled against the Slovak government because not only the Jews suffered under the fascist regime, also the Slovak people. And uh, therefore, uh, Germany uh, occupied Slovakia not because they wanted to occupy the country, but because they wanted to save uh, the Slovak government from this uprising. Uh, many soldiers and, and police, they, they rebelled as well and uh, defected from the army and joined the rebellion. So at the time when the Germans come to Slovakia, uh, they become, of course, very efficient. Uh, they defeated the uprising and uh, we were still uh, at the time hiding and uh, trying to escape arrest. But uh, at this stage, we knew that sooner or later, uh, somebody will betray us and therefore we have to leave. And so we left uh, the village. My father still stayed because he, he had to look after his, uh, his uh, farm, after the livestock. And uh, he said that people will help him because the people were a little bit uh, helpful to us because all hated the fascist regime in Slovakia. And so uh, my father left, was left behind and my mother, my brother, and myself, uh, we left the village and we were going to another village where we would pretend that we were uh, Gentiles and people didn't know us. And uh, so uh, perhaps uh, live through this without being detected. But unfortunately, uh, we were captured in November 1944 by the Gestapo and uh, we were deported uh, uh, to Germany. But before this, uh, we found out, uh, before we were deported, we found out that eventually my father was betrayed uh, by the person in the village and he was taken away. At the time we were notified that uh, he was taken away. And at the time already the news, uh, we knew what was happening in Auschwitz. We knew about the uh, gas chamber and all the atrocity. I, I say we, but I, I, not as children, I'm talking about the adult among us, and I didn't know anything. But um, so at the time when we heard that my father was taken away, we thought, that's it, we will never see him again. Uh, but we received a, a postcard from my father just before we were captured and there were uh, uh, three or four words he said don't worry I'm alive and that was the last time we heard from my father we didn't know 
where the postcard come from and what happened. As it happened, he survived, uh, which this was also by miracle, but he, he was being uh, taken to Auschwitz and uh, in this carriage where he was, uh, there was a Hungarian crook. He, 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 he was a man that used to break into safes and things like this. And uh, he hid a saw blade in the handle of a suitcase. And when they were being transported, uh, he stood up during the night because this transport went through the night. Uh, they didn't want to show what the Germans were doing uh, with the Jewish people. And uh, he stood up and he said, I'm going to open the door of the carriage and who wants to uh, save himself to, to jump after me. And so he proceeded to cut the chain that held the uh, cattle car uh, gate. I don't know if you know my, how cattle car look, but there is a sliding door because they put cows and uh, horses in. And um, he cut the chain and uh, he was able to put the hand through the door and open it. And um, he jumped out. My father was uh, beside him. My father jumped out as, as well. And after my father, another person jumped. Apparently, three people jumped out of this carriage. What happened to the rest? I, I tried, I was trying to research, of course, I didn't, didn't find any record of it, but I can only assume uh, that they probably ended up in the gas chamber of Auschwitz. So my father uh, joined uh, the resistance army, the partisan in Slovakia, and he fought against the Germans uh, till end of the war and survive, but of course we didn't know this. We were taken to Belgen Belsen. We were the first transport from Slovakia with mother and children that didn't go to Auschwitz. First transport since the uh, deportation started. Slovakia had uh, around 80,000 Jews living in Slovakia. It is estimated that only about 15,000 uh, survived. Rest of them all ended up in the Auschwitz gas chamber and uh, were murdered. We were the first transport. And the reason was uh, we were transported uh, from the second of November 1944 uh, till the 9th of uh, 1944. The Germans at the time already were retreating from the Russian onslaught and on the 7th of November 1944, they blew up uh, the gas chamber of Auschwitz because they didn't want to, that the Russians find out what they were doing. And that was the reason that we were diverted in, at the, uh, uh, apparently at somewhere around Berlin, and we were diverted instead of going to Auschwitz, we were diverted and we went to Belgium, Belsen. Belgium, Belsen was an extermination camp. We did not have in Belgium, Belgium, uh, gas chamber, or there were no experimentation. Uh, there were people were dying in Belgium, Belgium from starvation and disease. Even though Belgium, Belgium was not an uh, extermination camp, in Belgium, Belgium, over 70,000 people died, mostly of them, 
uh, Jews, but also many Polish and Russian soldiers uh, that were in uh, Belgian Belsen before the German decided uh, that they would convert uh, camp for uh, uh, mostly Jew, but uh, there were uh, uh, gypsies and Jehovah Witnesses uh, and uh, German political prisoners, which were treated just the same way as we were treated, very cruelly. And as I said, uh, uh, Belgian Belgian Belsen. Uh, become one of the most uh, uh, cruel and uh, savage camps in uh, Germany. As I said, people were dying from starvation. People were dying uh, from disease, mainly uh, typhoid. Uh, we had a crematoria in Belgium, Belsen uh, from the beginning the crematoria could call. In other words, uh, all the corpses were brought to crematoria and they were born, burnt. But uh, from January, when many inmates come to Bergen Belsen from Auschwitz and another, another camps, in other words, they were from the West, from the Poland and the other countries when the uh, German army retreated to the east, uh, Germany and Czechoslovakia, many of these inmates ended up in uh, Belgian Belsen. So the camp was built for about uh, 25,000 inmates, uh, but within very short time in 1945, uh, the population of Belgium, Belgium, became over 60,000. There was not uh, enough food. There was not, not enough uh, uh, help uh, to looking after the inmate. And medication was not there, even though after the liberation, they found a big hut packed with medication and the doctor never used the medication to help the sick people. For this, he was one of the people uh, that was sentenced to death, it was the doctor, because he didn't use and try to uh, save people. And as I said, uh, man, the uh, reason was, was the typhoid. Uh, if you got a typhoid, it was like a, a, a sentence to death. Uh, you got diarrhea, you got dehydrated, eventually you had no strength to collect your food, and finally you died. So the people in uh, uh, January, February, began to die in vast number, it is estimated, that people died about 500 per day. The crematoria could not cope with that amount of corpses. So the corpses were just thrown out in the open. As a child, I remember playing with other children, uh, catch and uh, hide and see among these corpses. We didn't hide behind wall or trees. We hid behind uh, corpses. And um, uh, I can't describe uh, what we saw uh, during this period. But as children, we, we played and we couldn't understand fully what was happening here. We knew it was wrong, but uh, because we didn't have the full understanding, I must say that uh, the children survived the concentration camp much better uh, than the adult people. It affected the adult people all their life. Some of them are still today in, in uh, 
in in uh, isolated in in psychiatric places and uh, this is I'm just saying it because uh, uh, I I read about it uh, that in Israel they have uh, uh, institution that that are looking after people that uh, in the evening when they're eating they're putting food into their pocket because they think that in the morning they will and uh, not get food so it's it's uh, for that reason I must say that uh, I survived the Holocaust from psychological um, uh, side very well I never suffered I never had nightmare uh, but uh, as as uh, I said from the beginning for fifty years. I couldn't speak about it, not because I didn't want to speak about it. I I just couldn't. And when I started to speak about it, uh, it was very emotional for me, and I quite suffered. But it, it was such a strength in me that I had to do this, that I, I, I decided to do it. In fact, my wife, she passed away in uh, 2003. Uh, I only started to speak about it in uh, 2004, 2005. So my wife, I never told anything. My wife, she died not knowing uh, what I went through. She knew I was a Holocaust survivor, but I never told her uh, what, I, what I went through. Well, in, uh, I mean, there are many details. Uh, the life in Belgium, Belgium was horrific. Uh, what we saw there, how people were handled, how people were humiliated, beaten, uh, and the cold name and everything that uh, it's very difficult even to uh, describe. But uh, eventually, uh, we were liberated. Uh, it was on the fifteenth uh, of April, nineteen forty-five. We were liberated by the British Army, uh, and they come just on time, as far as I'm concerned, because I was like a skeleton, and if they didn't come when they did. Uh, if they come several weeks later or a month or so, uh, who knows if I will be here speaking to you. So my life in the Holocaust was uh, uh, very, very traumatic. But after the Holocaust, the life went and I took the attitude always to look forwards, not backwards. And this optimistic uh, outlook uh, was very important. And uh, I, uh, I had this, this slogan that I adopted, and it, it goes, make peace with the past so it won't spoil the present. And this is what I did. I don't uh, carry any hatred uh, still. I actually... I wanted to meet uh, one of the perpetrators whom I discovered that was still alive in Germany. Uh, she she passed away only about two or three years ago. She was 90. But when she was in Belgium, Belgium, uh, she was uh, just in the 20, 20 24, 25 year old and uh, I discovered she was alive. Of course, I didn't know how anything like this, but uh, she must have visited our our block, and uh, I was in touch with her daughter. I was prepared to meet her, uh, just sort of close the circle as, as a perpetrator and as a, as a victim meeting, and having a uh, conversation. She, she was sentenced to one year in prison for killing two people. There were two witnesses 
um, and uh, she got one year uh, after the war. This, 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 this what the justice was about. Uh, she killed two people and she was in prison for one year. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, many of these murders uh, got very lightly uh, off the hook. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, you know, yeah. but I think yeah. I I did go on too long already. So, <laughs> no, um, I would like to leave it to you now. Yeah, you Tommy, can. thank you for that. I mean, we we could genuinely sit here and listen all evening, and as I did last week, um, you know, Muriel, we we're, were in Troll meeting, meeting you and um, and Joyce and. Um, you know, I think the couple of things that stood out was particularly, you know, being a six year old um and a nine year old and and um, you know, you talk about six year old um six year olds today, maybe they're a little bit more tech savvy, but I certainly think at that age there's an innocence that, you know, if that's torn from a from a child, um it just, you know, beggars you know, really belief and it's so hard to fathom. And that you were, you were, you know, that was being taken away. Doesn't matter what period of anybody's life, but six and and you know nine is such a a precious time. And um, and you know your your life was was utterly changed. And you know, um, I'm going to open it to the to to the group to our, our audience. Um, but we we did talk a little bit about you know human nature, and then mixed in with religion. Um, and how that's distorted, and um, you know, I asked you like, you know, why is there that in a human? We we talked about the simplicity of life, and um, how how people could could do that to a fellow human, and um, and you had some thoughts about that. You wouldn't mind sharing just your your views again. Yeah, it's it's it's. Um... This is a question that, uh, you know, there's no answer. And I, as you know, I, I did uh, three documentary films and one of them, I think it was the first one, uh, the, uh, where at the end of the film, uh, I'm sitting in the, the museum in Belgium, Belsen, and uh, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, uh, I'm being asked, why? Why this happen, you know? And and uh, I just look in the distance and, and, and I say, why? I still don't know why. It's, uh, but unfortunately, uh, history, it's, it's amazing how history repeats itself. And of course, uh, when the Second World War ended, we said never again. I mean, what we discovered, what happened, it was in the darkness. Nobody knew because the, it was all hidden from us. And we said this will never happen again. And when we look what happened since since uh, uh, the Second World War, it, only, only to speak about Africa, Biafra, and all these these countries are so far away that sometimes a person can't even uh, like think about it. It's it, it's something that is happening there. But of course, we also had in the Central Europe things that we couldn't even uh, think that in in this open society that we see everything now it's happening it happened front of our eyes when it happened in Srebrenica which is in Central Europe and we saw the films and and people were being separated and front of the whole world there were people that could shoot other people and I'll be talking not about a small number 
over 7,000 men were massacred only because they were Muslim. There was no reason these were civilian people. They had no weapon in their hand. They didn't fight. And it happened with, uh, with the... So, and today uh, we, we have Ukraine and we uh, seeing atrocity. We are reading about it. Uh, uh, civilian people, their, their homes are taken away, and they are being murdered in, in the hundreds and thousands. And again, we are all watching it as entertainment on television, and we can't, can't intervene and stop it. So, yeah, as you say, it, it's an on, we, ongoing. Did we ever learn? that all the weapons that we have and everything don't solve the problem. But it is a simple pen is the thing that in the end solves the problem. Why can't it happen before? Why so many people have to die before it stops? Yeah. Thank you again for a wonderful commentary. Um, and we'll we'll come back to some of those topics, but I, I feel um we've we've come to eight thirty um, but I just want to check, Tommy, are you okay to stay on a little bit longer for some questions? Oh, of course, audience, if you don't need to worry about me. It's <laughs> about you, how you are situated. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm good. I'm here, free. I'm <laughs> just in going. the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we and, and you and I can actually speak for a change without being interrupted by um, anybody else. Uh, although we have wonderful people here to to mm -hmm. support that. So I'm I'm going to go straight to the first person I see on my screen, Hugh McDermott. Um, if you could unmute, please. Thomas, uh, I I'd like to thank you for your talk to us tonight. I visited Auschwitz uh, some years ago so that I would remember never to forget the atrocities that happened. And I know in your last comments, you said that they are still happening. And we both live in hope that uh, they will not continue, but at some time they will stop. And part of the reason I visited Auschwitz was to be able to pass on to my children the history that happened there and remind them that it wasn't prehistoric history, but it was not too far back or not, not very far from my own birth and, and uh, my life in, in, on this world. So I thank you very much. And it's a privilege to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Appreciate it. Uh, Patrick, hello. Patrick has to be hi. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, Thomas, it's an honour to see you and to hear you speak, and, and thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, probably it's a difficult question insofar as that um, we've, you and people like you must be very frustrated by it. The Holocaust deniers that we have to see and listen to, um, do you have some thoughts on that? I mean, really, when you think about it, the amount of evidence that's there to to refute what they what they tried to put across from even film that was that was recorded at the time when uh, you know the, the camps were liberated, we still have people who are deniers and 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 propaganda around it, not just deny it themselves, but actually pushing this propaganda. Do you have a thought on it? Well, it, it you know it, it even even uh, waste of time to think about these people. They do a lot of damage, especially uh, today with the media and uh, computer and you know, all the uh, ways that there are uh, sort of all kind of association, these crazy ideas and everything. The only comment I have uh, that uh, basically they're anti-Semite 
and uh, they hate Jews for they probably never met a Jew, but they hate Jews for uh, their own reason and um, they want to justify it by the lies that they would uh, uh, spread. But there are people that uh, they call themselves uh, historian and they trying to uh, uh, justify what they are saying that it uh, uh, physically it was impossible. But at least they beginning to admit that uh, something did happen. And uh, today, many of these people are trying to make much narrower uh, 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 narrower uh, space for, you know, the, as a Holocaust, the, the whole thing. Uh, but more uh, to say that Hitler uh, did not did not know about it. It's not his fault. Uh, these are the sympathizer, and they justifying it because there uh, doesn't exist a single document that Hitler signed that anything like this should happen to the uh, to the Jews. But there is a lot of evidence of what he said. And in his public speeches, uh, he uh, condemned the Jews that they were the one, of course, during the World War I, uh, that it's the Jews Fault that uh, the German lost the World War One, and uh, this that does deserve to die in World War Two. You know, uh, so uh, as I say, I don't want to even uh, think about these people. They just anti-Semite. They hate Jews, and they find all kind of justification. Uh, why they hate the Jews. I mean, in America especially, uh, there, there's even today such propaganda uh, some places. And, and, and we see it in Europe. It's uh, uh, sadly uh, that the anti-Semitism is again growing down. Thing. But the main thing is, of course, and that's what I uh, preach in my uh, uh, my lecture, especially to, to student, uh, it's not only uh, Jewish people, but uh, it's the racism that's going on, the discrimination. Uh, there are a lot of things today, uh, immigrant, and I remember when it uh, we, we began to receive the immigrant here, the government uh, was very slow. Uh, to let uh, some of these people come. I remember they gave permission to 2,800 uh, immigrants. And I, I, of course, the history uh, from the war is that, uh, unfortunately, Ireland uh, didn't want to take any Jews. And I said, well, they have now some opportunity to show some compassion and take some of these people because uh, they they not coming to Ireland uh, for having a holiday. They 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 coming because they want to live, and uh, thank God uh, Ireland uh, really did uh, do now and uh, let many people to come to Ireland, and uh, I'm very happy about that. But unfortunately, lately, um, Irish people demonstrated that that. Um, uh, against the influx, uh, but uh, thank God more welcome the uh, people. So I'm not only talking about uh, the Jewish problem, but uh, uh, the problem of the the, the Afro Asian uh, people and uh, people of different. Uh, um, uh, uh, different uh, thinking and behaving that we do. So uh, it's important to, to teach the young people 
are not allowed uh, to get this bullying in school, racial bullying, uh, and, and stop it before it can uh, expand. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a problem uh, that has to be tackled uh, before it's too late. That's what happened uh, with the Jewish people. By the time they realized what was happening, it was too late and uh, tragically uh, so many uh, were murdered. Thank you, Tom, Tommy. Um, Dominic, hello. If you can kindly unmute yourself, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, Tommy. Thank you yeah. for a fantastic presentation tonight. Tommy, I just want to ask you, I, mean, I think you were coming to the end of it, or you were beginning, beginning to, to answer my question there at the end of your last answer to Patrick. Um, if you, you, you've you've lived this, you've you have directly experienced this, and you're still here talking to us about it, and that's a very rare thing. If you had the chance to get every single head of every country in the world together in a big room, and they were all sitting down in front of you, and you could stand up on the podium, and if you had five minutes to talk to them. What would you say? Well, I tell, I always think about this thing because if just take Europe, uh, if we talking about uh, the amount of people that they took in, it's minute. The the tragedy of it is that everybody has some kind of excuse. Ireland is not a rich country, but it, it's also it's not a poor country. If everybody took some of these people, it, it, it's a small problem. The problem is that people say, we don't want anybody. And, and, and it, we don't share the burden of helping these people. There is a problem. We have to distinguish between the people that just want a better life or something and uh, or, or they want to take advantage of the social welfare of a country. This is not these people that we should help. We have to help the people that really, I mean, taking out the, the uh, event in... in in um, the Ukraine, these people don't don't want to live in Ireland. They they want to go back, but they can't stay there. They have to leave. We have to help them. I know Ireland has, has a big problem with uh, with um, uh, you know people have no homes and things like this. But there must be a way that we can some way share it. Both problems are problems. We just can't say we have a problem, so we still, so who cares about the other people? These people are not coming here to take jobs or anything like this. They come in here, they want to live because they were so mistreated in their own country. So if I could, I could take the, this leader, just the, why you don't want to share this burden? Uh, I mean, we are, what, 200 million or something? So if, if we take another 2 million, 3 million people, it, it's nothing, you know. Yeah, I mean, Tommy, I think, you know, and one, one, one you know, aspect that you've touched on a lot is younger people. You know, the fact that you've spoken to so many young people in schools, you know, it's an area um, at Humanism Ireland we look to do about, you know, that type of engagement. And you know, I myself um, represented Ireland at a European Youth Parliament in Barcelona in 1992. And my biggest memory takeaway was that I felt equal to everybody there that was 16, 17, 
Um, and we were in the Parliament of Catalonia talking about, you know, real, you know, big people topics. But it felt like we, we had more sense of maybe the solution. So maybe the question might be more, Dominic, getting the young people of the world in a room. Um, because maybe some of the older people, um, you know, that, that mindset um, of having compassion and, you know, senses of vitriol and, you know, angst and against them, um, you know, adults and the, no matter what it is, but maybe it's the younger groups that really, you know, hopefully um, have been listening to you. And I, I know they have, because I've seen, I've seen the, the footage um, as many, many people probably have. And um, that's really, um, you know, amazing to see how they've responded to you um, and as we are tonight too. And um, so, Jeremy Goggin, Good evening. I, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Tommy. I I want to interrupt you for a minute. I I I participated in a seminar mm -hmm. in uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, there was student, Protestant student, and Catholic student, and they were discussing the the problem, and you know the Protestant uh, uh, would say the the Catholic they they are the uh, terrorist and of course vice versa and and um, uh, they discuss this 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 uh, uh, problem and I, I was participating there so uh, in the end uh, as it was uh, uh, coming to the end uh, I say the idea of this uh, conflict where does it start? It starts from childhood. And you go to Northern Ireland, you have Catholic schools, you have Protestant schools. And why they don't learn together from childhood? Why they already separated at the age of six? How can you keep people and the student, they just jump up and they said, that's what we want. But the system is not letting them to do this. Yeah, I mean, my my parents were from Belfast and the Falls Road, so um, I was fortunate enough to get to live here in in in, in the south of Ireland. And um, you know, it is about um, mindset and education. I completely agree. And um, I will move on to um, Gerard Goggin. Good evening. Um, how are you, sir? How is Waterford? Good evening. Everything is. Who's down here at this point in time? Uh, Sorry, I, I, I do you have to speak a little louder. Can you speak a little louder? Or, sorry. Um, oh, yeah. That's better? Yeah, that's better, yeah. Yes. Um, Thomas, thank you ever so much for your wonderful uh, insight that you've given us into that most terrible of events that human history has got to uh, um, put up with and that humanity should be so offended by it all. Uh, I would like to know whether or not you have an opinion, and here I'm not trying to compare one situation with the other, they're not comparable, but do you have an opinion on what is happening to the Palestinian people at the present point in time? Well, it's, it's uh, of course, we know it's a big, big problem in the Middle East. Uh, it, 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 it wouldn't be secret that I, of course, would uh, side with, with the Israeli uh, opinion. But I admit, uh, uh, I'm living here for the past 60 years, so, uh, but I hear you hear, we all hear what's going on, and we have to uh, uh, get our own, our own opinion on what should happen. I admit that uh, I, I served in the Israeli army. I, uh, I participated in the uh, uh, US campaign in 1956, so I was fighting. Uh, for my survival for the second time and uh, 
in all my uh, experience in the army, I was never taught uh, to kill Arabs for the sake because they're Arabs. Uh, but we were taught, of course, and that we have an enemy and uh, we have to defend ourselves. We are in a small minority surrounded for hundreds of millions of, of people that don't like us. Uh, so uh, basically, I can say that, that there are extremes on both sides, and especially uh, today I'm not very happy of the politics of Israel of today. And so I think it will take another generation till a progressive people will represent uh, uh, both sides and will be prepared to uh, give and take uh, to achieve uh, peace. And again, I would say all this struggle and 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 weaponry and murder that's going on will end up with a pen. They will sit together and they will sign a, a peace. Can't that happen now? It looks like it, it still has to go uh, quite a while uh, before we will uh, uh, see some result. But I, I must, I must, I'm optimistic. There are signs, I mean, there are more peaceful nation now, uh, something that uh, only a couple of years we wouldn't have believed. And this is the Abraham. Uh, agreement uh, with several uh, Arab states and uh, hopefully there will be more and eventually together with the Arab nation and Israel uh, there might be a, a Palestinian state uh, that will accommodate the people that have no home today so Let's be optimistic. Thank you ever so much for your comments. Thank, Thank you, Jared. Um, next comment, please. I don't see your name. I just see SDPC. Could you say your name, please, first? Um, hello. Uh, so go ahead and un unmute yourself. Sorry, please. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, hello. hello. Oh, hi, Michael. Hi, Tommy. Um, I really feel privileged to be listening. Your, your name, please. Sorry. Sharon Donahue. Sharon. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, Tommy, I just had a, a question. Did you ever come to a conclusion that was satisfactory to you about why your neighbours would have betrayed your father or betrayed your family or why they did that to other people? Well, and the person that betrayed my father, he he was a captain in the Hlinka Guard. And the Hlinka Guard, these were the, uh, the force that protected the government. But during this uh, uh, Holocaust time, they were also responsible for arresting the Jews. I saw it, it, it was a local man uh, and uh, I saw two letters that he wrote to his uh, superiors which were in the city and there he writes about my family I have these copies uh, um, where, where he mentioned that uh, how it is that uh, this parasite and he's referring to my parents and my grandparents are here and nobody's doing it, nothing about it. Now, this man was a child uh, during time before, and he used to do messages for my grandfather. You know, my grandfather had a shop uh, in, the, in the village. 
and um, when he has to deliver sometimes people come order something and then he would send it over he would go and make the message and my grandfather would give him sweets uh, for doing it. And I remember when he came to arrest my grandparents and um, he stood in the door and he said uh, to my grand grandfather, he said, uh, Mr. Reichenthal, you have to be in 10 minutes uh, ready and you have to come with us. And my father was pleading with him. He said, uh, um, he, and he called him in the first name because he knew him as a, as a uh, young man. They were, they were friends. Uh, and he said, uh, Otto, Otto was his name. He said, Otto, why are you doing this? You used to make messages for my, my father. Uh, and you... And he looked, I mean, I was witness to it. He looked up and he said, I have orders and I have to carry them out. He didn't look at my father and uh, he took them away. And then uh, how he betrayed my father, my father was uh, outside I, I remember he used to take me at a little motorbike and uh, he used to take me to the field outside of the village to see that everything grows without a disease and everything. And this time he was out, he had uh, his dog and stick and he walked outside and he sees this lorry uh, coming opposite and he didn't think anything about it. Uh, but unfortunately, the lorry belonged to the Hlinka guard, and he was in the lorry. And uh, when he realized it was too late, otherwise he would have jumped into the ditch and that the lorry would pass. And, uh, but uh, he recognized my father and he shouted, that's a Jew, stop. And he arrested him. He didn't even allow him to go to the house to take some clothes or anything because it was a shame that people from the village will see uh, that uh, he did uh, he did this so after the war when we come back uh, we asked my father i said why don't you go to the authority and and now to to you know complain what what he did and think and he turned to us and he said, but he, he what we call, turn, uh, he turned his uh, coat inside out. You know, when they say changing his, uh, the, from being a, a fascist, he became the best communist. And my father said, if I go to complain now, who are they going to believe? A little Jew or... or this uh, communist and he never complained he never never did. his son is uh, still in the village and the coincidence was that his son bought our house at, i'm talking now after the war and i i come to a visit to the village uh, about 40 years later after the war from here i traveled to Slovakia, and uh, he was just uh, uh, taking the house apart, and he was on the top of the roof taking the thing off the roof, and you know the bricks because uh, during the communism uh, they couldn't afford anything, you know, so they took it and used it for the new house, you know, they used the material. And uh, I was sort of looking, and he said, uh, who, who are you looking for somebody? And uh, I said, no, I lived in this house all my childhood. And he said, you told me right on top. I said, yes. And he said, oh, come, let, let's go for a drink and thing. And I said, no, I, I, I haven't got time. I have to, to go. But then I was making the film. 
and they come to the village. And they, he was a carpenter. He was doing furniture for uh, churches, uh, furniture. And my producer wanted to show him the letter that his father wrote to his superior to tell him what his father was. So we, we sort of rehearsing the whole the scene. And you know, they have it on television here sometimes as well. They suddenly face you with something and you have to answer. And about 10 minutes before it happened, I said to, to my producer, uh, Jerry was his name, I said, Jerry, I can't do it. I, I, I don't think it would be fair. He wasn't even born when this thing happened. How how can I do this, this on him? But he has nothing to do with this. No, I don't want to do it. And I, I never did this. But my my brother, he, he had a factory for tools for carpentry. And he visited the village. And he brought him a whole set of tools and he gave it to him as a present <laughs> for manufacturing his furniture for the church. Uh, he had another brother, he became a, a professor uh, in mathematics. And my brother met him in Bratislava because he wrote a book and we, it, of sort of history of the village. And we never knew how our family come to live in this village. So he made it, he went back to Stone Age. There were caves that people lived there. So he researched the whole development of the thing. But he only mentioned my uh, grandparents, my parents. He mentioned myself and my brother. And uh, he said to, to, to himself, he invited him to a, uh, he was a professor of mathematics, he invited him to uh, the hotel and he said, uh, uh, he wanted to know, you know, you researched the history of the village. How did the Jew come uh, to live in, 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 because his book, went from, I don't know, what, uh, 1800 or maybe back even more, to 1949. Uh, 19, uh, no, 1939. And 1939, he stopped because his father became one of the fascists. So mm -hmm. he stopped it there. So when he, my brother was speaking to him, he said, uh, how did the Jewish people? So he said, uh, well, I, I tell you the truth. I'm a mathematician. And for me, everything has to be 100% correct. And if I tell, told you, I'm not really very sure. So I rather don't want to tell you how the Jewish people come there. But of course, the whole subject was very, very sticky for him. <laughs> uh, since then, he passed away as well. But uh, yeah, we, we, had, uh, we had still some archive material from this time. How they, uh, they so. Uh, the people in, in the village didn't like them. They didn't like him and his son. Uh, he's not very popular in the village. Uh, so he was sort of an individual that uh, fascist that didn't like the Jewish people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Is that um, okay for your answer? Brilliant, perfect. Um, we are at nine oh four, according to my um my laptop, and um again conscious of everybody's time, um and uh, kindness to attend. We've had re very good numbers this evening, um over fifty people, so that's really wonderful. Yeah. Um, 
I can see if anybody else would like one more question. Tommy, would you be open to that? Just to, just to check if we have let's, one more. Let's do it, maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. If there's anybody if, else. If, if, yeah. Opportunities there. Um, I don't see any, so I think that's a, a little sign that we have had um, everybody's um, input and questions. Um, you know, again, like I think personally, um, you know, I've been to Medinic in Poland, Auschwitz, and you know, I've seen it, like I've visibly seen it, um, and I certainly, I certainly felt when I met you last week that you are, you know, the best of what humanism is, if I can say that. Um, I know you talk about liberalism um, as a Jew. You know, we could talk all night about religion and if the world was a better place with or without um, the types of tribes. And even within, you know, Judaism, there are so many um, subdivisions. You know, I think it, it's just a never-ending story. But I think what's been fascinating about you is that no matter what a person is, um, you see them as, as, a, as just a, a human. And the, the forgiveness and the compassion, um, you know, is, uh, yeah, there's no, no words to it, really. So uh, on, on that note, um, I personally will say thank you um, for an opportunity to meet again uh, and for you to be on, on our event. Um, I'm sure I speak for everybody. It's been a very um, enjoyable evening. Um, mm. And uh, we, we thank you for, you know, the fact that you took the courage um, after all that time to um, go back to um, a hell um, you know, that none of us really will ever get to grips with, but you've been kind enough to, to be brave enough um, to speak up. Um, so for that, um, we thank you. Uh, I, so I want to also say, Michael, if anybody wants the book, they can get in contact with you. You can email me the names and uh, I will sign it. The book costs 15 euro. It's a very interesting book. And uh, if anybody, so you can send me an email and if there are 10 people wanted, I will sign uh, the book for them. And as I say, it's, it's a 15 euro a book. So I will send it then uh, to you. So No problem. And, um, you know, I think uh, you know, to conclude, if we, we we will ask your permission to post our talk on our YouTube channel and um, oh. of the of the ones you've seen and, and the wonderful speakers we've had so yeah. far if anybody has any questions after our talk and um, if you simply um, email info at humanism.ie we can we can get questions um, to Tommy as well and um, so Tommy we always seek to do this the final word um, to yourself so final word please of uh, this evening to yourself. Of course, I have to thank you, first of all, uh, to invite me to uh, present my uh, presentation uh, to your association and uh, uh, meeting new people. Thank you for uh, coming and listening. I know uh, there were quite a few people because I know from the sample that you sent me that the, 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 there was quite a, a good number that people uh, come and um, yeah uh, let's hope let's be optimistic and uh, think that uh, uh, thing will only get better i never complain i never complain that for the government that People of Ireland were always very good to me. I never experienced any discrimination. Quite the opposite. I was invited and received with the greatest respect. And I love Ireland. Brilliant. I think that's a, a nice way to finish. So, um, again, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, our website, www.hunis.ie. If you if you're new to our association, um, always happy to talk about uh, what we do across different platforms. Um, and uh, again, to all uh, who attended, 
um, thank you for taking the time. So on that note, I shall say good evening and um, a nice rest of you.